I've got um, a really nice job today because I get to talk to you all about one of my very favourite books. And this is The Confessions of St. Augustine. And I imagine if you're, um, if you're doing A-level religious studies, um, a number of you may have heard of St. Augustine in the, the, the sort of context of you discussing the problem of evil, because Augustine has a lot of things to say about the problem of evil. Um, but I thought I'd talk to you about confessions today because it meets the, um, the subject of our day-to-day, -day, creation and cosmology, because in this book, um, we are dealing with a human creation because Confessions as a text is a beautiful literary and theological text authored by Augustine. And I'm gonna tell you about some of its features in this talk today. But also one of the central themes that Augustine covers in this text is divine creation. And in this book, he identifies God as the creator of the world um, um, and, a, and as a creator who creates the world out of nothing. Um, so this is, this is a really sort of wonderful text for uniting these themes of human creation and divine creation. So just first of all, just to give you some context um, to tell you a tiny bit about Augustine before I jump into the narrative. Um, Augustine, and here he is in his later life with a lovely bishop's mitre on looking very stately, Augustine was born on the 13th of November in the year 354, so in the fourth century. And his birthplace was a very small town called Tagaste in North Africa, a place, a place which in the present day is named Souk Aras, and it's found in Algeria. Um, so he's a North African theologian. In Augustine's day, Tagaste was on the southern edge of the Roman Empire and the Romans had ruled over it for 300 years. And so the culture that Augustine was brought up in was very much a Latin one. The, the, you know, the town had very good access to trade routes and to transport, and it was a very short sea journey for Augustine uh, from, from where he was to Italy and back. And in the book, we learn that he does go to Italy and that's where he receives um, some of his training in Milan. And Augustine's parents were very ambitious. For their eldest son Augustine and they saw a classical education as integral to him uh, securing a successful career for himself so in the text we learn how through this ambition Augustine was set on a route to becoming a very skilled orator um, someone who uses rhetoric and trains others in the use of rhetoric and writing and speech making and in the text, we also hear about his schooling in the city of Carthage, including his licentious student days, but also the very high regard that he developed for a number of classical authors. So, um, and those include Virgil and Cicero. So this is a text that's not only studied by theologians and is sort of central to um, the, the work of, of Christian theologians. But this is a text that's also shared by philosophers because in this text, um, Augustine discusses the things like the nature of time, the nature of memory, the nature of existence, but it's also um, shared by classicists. Classicists will engage with this text and see you know, the, the deep impact that Virgil's writings, for example, had on Augustine's thought and his textual composition. So this is a text that's a really multidisciplinary textual resource and a number of students across different subjects in the university will no doubt have access to this at some point um, in their learning. And on this slide, um, this, is, this is a picture, this is a painting from the early Renaissance period of Augustine and it's by Antonello de Messina. And it was, it was, um, it was made in the 15th century, so long, long, long after Augustine's death. But um, so there's a bit of there's a bit of background information about Augustine, when he was born, what kind of a place he was born into, and what kind of a career he was born into. But I thought I'd dive in straight away now, be reading you a quote from Augustine's work. And actually, I wanted to read you the very first lines of um, the work here. So this is on the next slide. So the book opens like this. Augustine says, you are great Lord and highly to be praised. Great is your power and your wisdom is immeasurable. Man, a little piece of your creation, desires to praise you, a human being bearing his mortality with him, carrying with him the witness of his sin and the witness that you resist the proud. Nevertheless, to praise you is the desire of man, a little piece of your creation. You stir man to take pleasure in praising you because you have made us for yourself 
and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Now that's the very first opening lines of confessions and those final bits, um, you have made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Those are very famous words and they're often sort of on inspirational quotes and, and memes that get passed um, around the internet. But um, those of you who haven't read the text um, before, but maybe have heard of the text or maybe have heard of, August of, of Augustine, will perhaps know that the text as a whole details Augustine's conversion to Christian faith after a youth spent in this high learning that I mentioned earlier, this sort of high training in rhetoric. Um, and it, it also details his conversion to Christianity after um, a life of sin in his own narration. And he mentions here that um, he's carrying the witness of his sin in this passage. Um, and across the text, we learn about Augustine's insatiable hunger for good food, beautiful art and music and for sexual fulfillment as well and these these are all aspects of his life that he discusses his early life that he discusses in the text um in the text he talks about his his youthful licentious behavior and a number of my my students like reading these um these passages about his student days and he tells us about his commitment to an illegal religious sect in the time um manichaeism and he also tells us about the despair and the tears that this behavior that he that he had um, as a youth um, all the, the despair and the tears that the, the this behavior caused his mother Monica who sort of held up in the text as this this great example of Christian behavior um, so there's a lot of detail in the text about his life his emotional states and his revulsion of certain practices certain habits and certain character traits that he develops that he comes to dislike about himself you know he really comes to dislike his 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 over love of, of food and entertainment and um and theater and art and music and sex and all of these things and he he really comes to hate these other things about himself um and if you put it if you put it this way if i if i'm telling you all this stuff that he narrates in this text um it's the book this book starts to sound a little bit about an autobiography like an autobiography um you know in 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 greek um, autobiography, um, autos, self, bios, life, and graphene to write. Um, these words come together. Obviously, if we think about what an autobiography means, it, it's a it's a write. It's a story of oneself. It's the narrative of one's on one's own life that what is writing. Um, and and it may be that if you know you pick up the text um, and you read all of these things about Augustine's life in it, and you sort of presume to yourself, well, this sounds very much like the first uh, sort of of autobiography um, but it isn't simply an autobiography and that will hopefully have come through in the the passage that I just read you here the very beginning of the book it's not this this text isn't simply the story of his life even though it is a story of his life it's not mere, merely a series of details about his changing psychological states although it is that you know it's not merely a series of details about his conversion narrative although it is that and it doesn't simply just have this historical timeline. It isn't just simply linear, like most autobiographies are. Um, and if we look at this passage again that I read you a moment ago, and I stated that this is how he begins, we begin to see how this book cannot just simply be an autobiography. Um, these lines set the tone for the whole. They establish some of his major theological and philosophical themes. They begin to hint at Augustine's indebtedness to Neoplatonic metaphysics. And that they show as well, these opening lines, they show that as Augustine writes his theology, his own words become inexor inexorably intermeshed um, with the words of scripture that he knows so well. Um, one of the things I've done here is I've put in brackets every time Augustine mentions a line that's actually a quote from scripture and you'll see that is this this opening these opening lines of text are littered with scriptural references augustine isn't just speaking his own words here he's he's using the words of scripture to make his points and so what we learn from this text is that augustine's life um, was one full of worship was one full of praise was one full of liturgy and his own his own comments in this book um he's constantly reciting um both uh, texts from the Bible and from the, the sort of liturgical texts that he would have um, come across in his um, um, in his life. So 
these opening lines signal to us just how much Augustine's interpretation of his own life and his own life story in this book is channeled and mediated through the prism of numerous um, biblical stories and songs. And what we also see in these opening lines, and this is in a way quite uncharacteristic of any text you firstly might expect to be found published as a Penguin classic, as this, as this text is, but also quite uncharacteristic of an autobiography, is that what you can see here is that the work itself, Confessions as a text, is set up as a prayer. It's set up as a searching, prose poem addressed to God, addressed to the divine creator in whom Augustine has faith. So here we are, this really striking opening line. It's like, it's unlike any other line you might expect to see in an autobiography, no matter who the autobiography is written by. But here he says, you are great Lord and highly to be praised. His immediate audience is therefore not the reading public, it's the God to whom he believes he owes his existence. And so to move on from here, um, to take up this theme of, um, you know, what the book is for, what it's about, what it actually is, um, that the book is actually in its form and its content of prayer, that provokes some questions about its purpose. You know, at one, at one stage in the text, Augustine is reflecting on the omniscience of the God to whom he is praying, you know, the all knowingness of the God to whom he is praying. And at this point, he points out that surely God has no need for him, Augustine, to confess anything at all. Augustine writes, Lord, to your eyes, the abyss of human consciousness is naked. What could be hidden within me, even if I were unwilling to confess it to you? I would be hiding from myself and I would not be hiding myself from you. So in this text, therefore, Augustine, you know, we are prompted to ask, okay, if the, the, if the immediate audience of this confession, this, this, this text, this autobiography is God, why is that the case? Surely if, if Augustine is praying to an omniscient God, he doesn't need to tell God about his life. His life will immediately be known to God. So it seems like there's some sort of, um, that seems a bit of an inefficient thing to do, uh, to tell God about yourself if God is omniscient and would surely know everything there is to know about you anyway. Um, but it's, it's not long before Augustine's sentiment about his inability to hide things from God um, issues in some more telling comments about the usefulness of Augustine's prayer in this text, if the prayer is not for the benefit of just giving God some information about himself. Um, in the text, um, he writes, when I am evil, making confession to you, God, is simply to be displeased with myself. And at this stage, um, we learn a little bit about, OK, so if Augustine isn't praying to God to tell God bits about himself, because surely God would already know these things. Um, we learn here that Augustine's addressing God for the benefit of his own self-knowledge. So when he's talking to God about himself, he's actually not only telling God things about himself, he's also confronting himself with himself. He's confronting himself with his sin, with his wounded soul, with his, with his misguided ways. So in this book, we could say it's a bit of a sort of a theological version of looking at yourself in the mirror, if you're gonna be crude about it. In speaking about his life, in a written document, Augustine is seeking to know his own desires, his own motivations, the source of his wrongdoing in the world, the source of the wrongdoing that he's so ashamed of. Augustine also goes on in the text to write the following. He says, when I am good, when I do good things, making confession to you, God, is simply to make no claim on my own behalf. For you, Lord, confer blessing on the righteous. So what he's saying there, just like before, he says, when I do bad things, making confession to you is simply to be displeased with myself. So when I do bad things and I tell you about them, God, I'm just kind of I am I'm, I'm letting you know, but I'm also confronting myself with the wrongdoing. When he says, when I'm good, making confession to you is simply to make no claim on my own behalf for you, Lord, confer blessing on the righteous. He's saying Augustine's faith here is that all of his goodness comes from God. So whenever he does good things, he's not bigging himself up. He's saying, I'm recognizing that the only reason I'm able to do good things is because you allow this God. 
And so to confess that he's done good things in this text is at the same time a way of thanking the creator that he's addressing in this text, just as doing the doing of good work in itself can only find its purpose, Augustine thinks, in the love and praise of God. So here we have a, another quote that I put up on the slide for you where Augustine says all of this explicitly. He says, I tell my story for love of your love, God. I am stirring up love for you in myself and also in those who read this so that we all, all of us may say, great is the Lord and highly worthy to be praised. So what we find in the text, if we put all of this stuff together, is that confessions as a text is staged as if we the readers are meant to be overhearing Augustine as he opens his heart in prayer before God. But from these lines in the text that I've just read you and that are on the slide, we're left in no doubt that Augustine actually wants to be overheard by us, his readers. This is a public document. It is a prayer, but it's not just written to God. Augustine is confessing openly and earnestly with his pen and before many witnesses. He's saying, I'm stirring up love for you, God, in myself and in those who read this. So his book is meant to be an attestation of praise for God, a recognition that God is the creator of the world. And at the same time, the one in whom the one to whom Augustine owes all of his life and any good thing that he ever does. Um, so one of the things I like to do when I'm teaching my students about this book and the narrative in it is that, you know, this is a very crude image. I'm just showing you a picture of the triangle on a slide now, but there's this dynamism in the narrative. So you might think of these sort of points of the triangle as different, um, as different subjects who are being addressed or are writing this text. So one of the corners we might think of as being Augustine, another of the corners of the triangle we might think of as being God and the other one as the reading public. And as Augustine writes to the God who is at the, the heart of things. We get, we get this upward trajectory. God is, a, um, Augustine is addressing God, um, but we are overhearing that conversation. So there's this dynamism. The narrative is not just functioning horizontally to talk to those human beings who are his companions in the faith. It's also addressed upward, uh, as it were, uh, to the transcendent God who is author of all things. Um, so now that I've said all of this about the narrative, what's going on in the text, what it's about, the, the fact that it's a prayer, the fact that it contains literally so much scripture, Augustine using the words of scripture um, to confess his praise for God. Um, let's turn our attention to the book's title and just go over this point again, because when we hear this word confession, um, the impulse might be to sort of think of a tell-all narrative. You know, there are a number of songs in the history of pop music that have this sort of um, word in them. And it's often, um, it's often associated with gossip, you know, the divulgence of some sort of secret that no one else is allowed to hear, details, facts pouring out. Um, my, you know, this this sort of a confession, if any of you have seen Star Wars, one of those famous um, scenes in cinematic history where Darth Vader confesses um, this 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 sort of secret that's not apparent to his son, uh, Luke Skywalker, that he is, um, that he is his son. And there's this moment of drama when this the truth comes out. And so we're used to thinking of confession in, the, in these terms as gossip, as something potentially sordid or secretive. But in the original Latin for of this word, the word, Confiteri, it carries much more the sense of acknowledgement, the sense of acknowledging something. So to confess something is to admit something, but it's to acknowledge and to agree something. So in this narrative, yes, Augustine is making confession about the sins that he's committed. You know, he's telling us about um, all the, some of the stupid things he's done in his life. You know, he, um, even in what we might think of as being quite insignificant, things you know he's got a whole story in the opening books where he talks about nicking a pear off a pear tree as a young boy and how this you know still fills him with guilt um, to this day so he is confessing his sin but he is also intending the text to be an admission of praise for God a confession of praise for God and as you've already seen that's how the text begins you know this um, line here you are great Lord and highly to be praised. And that's the primary mode of confession that's going on in this text. 
If you'll um, indulge me, I wanted to say a little bit more now about my interest in, in this book, and hopefully it will sort of um, inspire your interest in this book as well, because I think if it were any text, if you were interested in the history of the Christian tradition or Christian philosophy, then this is a really amazing book that you could read to prepare for university study. Um, so there are a number of reasons why I I find this book really interesting as a literary and theological creation. And the first one perhaps is Augustine's foray into the inner life that he does in this text, you know, throughout the text, but perhaps concentrated to a serious extent at the end of the work, you know, the, the final chapters of this book are not autobiographical in the sense that they don't tell us about Augustine's life. Rather, he has a few essays at the end of the book that are um, about themes, as I mentioned earlier, like time, memory, creation, um, subjectivity. And in these books, these essays at the end of the text, he fills his lines in supplication to God for help and answers with introspectively framed questions. So Augustine's constantly asking questions of God, but also of himself, because he's getting more and more confused about the nature of existence. And the text is, you know, really uncomfortable in some of its questioning. So he'll say literally things like, who am I? in this text, you know, he gets to the bottom of, he's trying to get to the bottom of who he is. Um, he asks, what is time in this text? And he's, you know, he says, provided nobody asks me, I know what time is. But when I'm asked to explain it, I can't tell you what time is. It, you know, it, it sort of exceeds his grasp and his knowledge. And so in the end, you know, in these, in these essays that are at the end of the text, that, you know, it's, they're seriously capable, these essays of eliciting existential anxiety at some points, at least as far as I'm concerned. You know, Augustine is reflecting on the precarity of the human self. You know, as part of this discussion of what time is, he's talking about how one's own past as a human being falls away into nothingness. We have no access to the pasts that we've lived, you know, the, 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 the things that we've gone through in life. We can't go back there. They fall away into nothingness, into non-being. Similarly, he thinks about the future of a human person. It can't be seen. You know, you can't have access to your future. Um, therefore, Augustine, as opposed to the God that he knows as the, as the creator of all things, who is eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, who he is addressing as the sort of foundation of his own life, God is his constant, you know, at the beginning, that passage I read you at the beginning, um, our hearts are restless, God, until they find their rest in you. That restlessness comes from Augustine's philosophical investigation into his own being and this realization that he cannot enter into his past, he cannot seek into his future, all that he has is the present moment. And that present moment is precariously balanced. Um, uh, as in, you know, that's the only bit of himself that he knows, the, the bit that's going on in the present. And it's difficult, you know, not to get carried away on the same thought experiments that that Augustine is getting into here. And there are some ways in which, even though he's a very ancient thinker, like I said, this is written in the fourth century, there's an undeniable foreshadowing, we might say, of the existential approach to philosophical thinking that you get in the sort of 19th and 20th centuries. You know, we get much akin to the musings of someone like Soren Kierkegaard in the 19th century, who, you know, asks, who am I? How did I get into the world? How did I get involved in this big enterprise called actuality? You know, that's there in Augustine. Um, and the simplicity of Augustine's inquiries this, this is a reason why perhaps so many commentators list the book um, and say that it's strikingly similar to, um, to, to modern texts in a way. It's a text that's able to speak to us in the now, and it doesn't really seem that distant to us as modern readers because of these existential um, questions. Um, however, it's also worth pointing out that um, many of Augustine's assumptions governing things like his notion of how we know things, his deep sense that there is a cosmic purpose to life. You know, as I said, that he begins this text with a point about God being the creator of all things, that God is alone is worthy of our worship, that God has created the universe and the whole purpose of the universe is to return to its maker. All of these assumptions Augustine has obviously differ in massive um, ways from popular secular ways of imagining the ins and outs of human life. So despite the fact that this is a, a text that can appeal, I think, to modern readers, there are these big differences in assumption. Um, and this interest, this 
I want to also say at this stage, this introspection, this inward turn that you get in Augustine's work, um, this, this turn inward to ask questions like, who am I? And to sort of think about the nature of the soul and what's most constant in human life. This has some of its origin in Augustine's regard for the role of reason, the role of the intellect, the soul in loving God and seeking him and divining the value of his creation. So this is another thing that interests me about this text is this regard for the role of reason in the theological inquiry. So I just wanted to read you a, a passage from the text here to make this clear. He says um, in this, and this is in, in book 10 of the work, he says, then I turned towards myself and I said to myself, who are you? And I replied, a man. I see in myself a body and a soul, one external, the other internal. Which of these, he asks, should I have questioned about my God, for whom I already had already searched through the physical order of things, from the earth to the heaven, as far as I could send the rays of my eyes as messengers. The reason why I've quoted this passage to you is that you can see in this passage Augustine's regard for the complexity of the human mind and the human ability to reason. That is, his regard for the ability that humans have to interpret the world around them, to develop rules, to cope with situations, and then to make new rules when those rules no longer work, you know, to make judgments about the right order of things, to play around with creation. And in this passage, we see that, you know, it turns out for Augustine that humans within the world are the pinnacle of creation. They're above other animals in the world, they're above all sorts of creatures, and this is because of the role of reason, and this is because humans are rational creatures. Humans, for Augustine, are the way that the world itself comes to know itself. They're the aspect of creation that allows creation to understand and make sense of itself. So it's only humans within the whole framework of the world that have this rational ability to reflect on the purpose of the world, reflect on the meaning of the world. Um, and he does make a number of comparisons with animals, you know, he says creatures can obviously enjoy the world, but they can't ask questions of the beauty and the meaning of the world. And the other thing we see in this passage is the, the regard that um, Augustine has for the soul as that through which that we as individuals know things. And he says in the text elsewhere, he says, what is inward is superior. Um, and so here he says, I've searched for God through the physical order of things from earth to heaven. He's looked for God in the world and he's finding trouble, finding God experientially in the world around him in what he can see and touch and taste and smell. But when he searches inward, he looks, he's trying to look further um, through the act, uh, through the sort of um, instrument of reason to know more about his God. So there we are, there's another aspect to this um, inquiry that Augustine is engaging with in the text. I also wanted to draw to your attention as people who might be persuaded to read this book, the fact that it's littered with irony. Um, and this is because the text, as I mentioned, may be an autobiography. It may be a text that's replete with details about who Augustine is. And Augustine blots on and on and on about himself in this text. But the irony of this is, is because he's completely, he's continually undercutting himself despite all of these details in his life story. He's constantly asking himself, despite the fact that he's writing all this stuff down, who am I? Who am I? He's constantly asking that question despite the fact, as I said, he's going on and on and on about his personal history. So what this is telling us about Augustine's um, regard for what the self is, about his regard for who we are as people, is that the self is not simply, for Augustine, a composite of externally observable behaviours. Because, as I said, he can write all this stuff about what's happened in his past and he still has this question, who am I? The self also for Augustine, and I mentioned a bit of this before when I was talking to you about his questions about time, the self for Augustine cannot be counted on as a stable and coherent I, you know, one subject that's absolutely the same through the course of time. You know, the self for Augustine, who I am, is not a private space apart from any, you know, um, investigation into its meaning. It's not some, it's not a private space in us that remains constant from one moment to the next, you know. The self for him is not some 
sort of core and abstract me, which I can dress up differently from time to time, um, asserting my identity in ever more diverse ways, you know, because for Augustine, the human self is not transparent to itself. Unlike God, who has his existence from himself, because God for Augustine exists most absolutely and is the only being in existence whose existence is necessary, who is transcendent, human beings aren't the author of themselves. Human beings receive their existence from without. Um, and this is something that um, Dr. Davison, who talked to you this morning, has, talked, has, has written about in his book, Participation in God, the idea that human beings and all things in the world are characterized by the fact that their existence is one they have by participation. It's not one that they're in charge of or that they can give to themselves. Um, so for Augustine, the reason why he's constantly asking, who am I, is that he understands that from infancy to adulthood, human beings are growing and changing. We're constantly exceeding ourselves at every moment. We're stretching beyond ourselves and we're therefore enigmatic to ourselves. We don't know what lies in our futures, you know, and that future will be still me, but it'll be in excess of what I am now. And that means that as a being, I am in constant flux. I am, I am precarious. I am not transparent to myself. I don't know my, I can never hope to know myself fully, all down to the ground. And so this also links back, this, this sort of precariousness that lies at the center of the text links back to that point about prayer I made earlier. Augustine finds in prayer the possibility that he can at least reveal some of his inner desires to himself and to God you know, to take a stock of what he's desiring, to take stock of what he wants and to get some kind of handle on them, some kind of control on them. But really, you know, this instable self is really at the heart of confessions, this self that is not able to be in charge of who it is at any given moment, um, but rather is really dependent on the lives of other people in the world and the lives of and, and, and God's grace. Um, and such is the situation that there's an Augustine scholar called John Cavadini, who's argued that it is genuinely misleading to talk about the self in Augustine or to describe what Augustine is doing as describing the self at all. Um, and Cavadini writes that for Augustine, someone who is self-aware is not of a self, is aware, sorry, someone who is self-aware is aware not of a self, but of a struggle, a brokenness, a gift, a process of healing, a resistance to healing, an emptiness, a reference that impels one not to concentrate on oneself in the end, but to concentrate on that to which one's self-awareness propels one, which in Augustine's case is to God. So someone in, in Augustine's view who is properly self-aware is aware of a constant transformation, a reconfiguring, a recreation of an identity from nothing, of becoming better and not of a stable entity that endures as a private inner space or object. So what I'm saying here is sort of getting through to you the implications of what I, you know, the very, the very title of this talk, the difference between what it means to create as a human being and what it means to create if you're God, because God creates everything out of nothing for Augustine, including human beings, whereas human creation, including what we're doing with ourselves in the world where we're acting and, and, and expressing ourselves every day. That kind of creation is nothing compared to the, the creation that God affects when he creates the world out of nothing. And so that, that really, that tension between what it, it means to be a human and what it means to be um, God is sort of written into every aspect of the text here. And it really does impress upon Augustine the notion that, um, we as human beings are being constantly remade. Um, we are constantly precarious, constantly balanced in the present moment, not able to have access to our past or to our future. Um, and then, you know, the, the, here's, here's something, the final thing I wanted to sort of draw out to you, and then perhaps we can then have some time uh, for questions um, about this text, or um, maybe if, um, if there, if there aren't many questions at this point, I can, I can um, raise some more themes that I like about the book. But um, the final thing I wanted to talk to you about um, here in terms of my interest in this narrative um, and an interest that again relates to this relationship between what it means to be 
a creator as a human being and a, and a creator as a divine being is Augustine's um, what we might call attention to the relationality in, in existence, the relationality that exists between all humans in community with one another. Um, but also the relationality that the human being has with God. Um, and in beginning his text with this prayer, where he addresses God and says that God is the one that's created him, and it's only when he returns to God that he will be at rest, you can really see uh, that that relation, relationality is key to Augustine's work. So as I've sort of indicated by describing some of the existential questions in this text, the register in confessions is one of searching. Um, what is primary in this text, as I've been as I've been pointing out, is Augustine's assumption that he is dependent on that which is not himself. So his existence is not something that he's in charge of. He is dependent on sources outside of himself to give yeah to give him life. God God's the one that gives him life. But in terms of his ideas and his creativity and his generativity, that's coming from other human beings as well. So he's not a subjectivist. Um, and you know, by subjectivism, what I mean is the idea that our own mental activity is the only unquestionable fact of our existence. You know, someone who thinks of um, the inner life um, as something um, uh, primary um, and just um, noble only to me. Rather, um, Augustine has a very shared view um, of what it means to be human and to have ideas and to, and to speak in the world and where we get all of our inspiration from. So the Confessions doesn't simply take place within the recess of, recesses of his own mind. Um, he doesn't think that it's his own mind that gives meaning to everything else in the world. He doesn't think subjectively. You know, the beauty of something in the world is not because he finds it beautiful. It's, beauty in, it's beautiful in and of itself. Um, so he also has um, in his work a whole book on memory, like I mentioned before. Um, seems a bit of an indulgent theme to talk about, but um, what the reason why he turns to the, the notion of memory in the text um, is because he's interested in if we can't have access to our past in in the way that you know you might walk into another room of your house in the present you know you can't walk into the past as if it were a room that you have access to but present to us in our memories are obviously um, stories about our past and he calls in that chapter he calls um, memory the stomach of the mind um, and in that way, what he means is that it's the um, the subject, a self's knowledge of the past in, in the sense that a subject takes in food from the outside and in contemplating that food through the stomach of the of the of the mind, the memory, his memory leads Augustine out of himself again. So just at the moment that you think he's sort of retreating inward and going on some sort of speculative inward journey and in thinking about his memories, what happens to Augustine is that those memories trigger um, events in the world that lead him out to contemplate the world again and to contemplate the people in his life that have inspired him and led to him having certain ideas and certain events in his life so that we see that there's not just this retreat inward and there's where it ends for Augustine but this retreat inward always um, moves outward again um, and he also has this real attachment to other people um, in the text on the occasion a very sad occasion um, in the text of a death of the death of his friend um, he writes for instance he says grief darkened my heart everything on which I set my gaze was death my eyes looked for him everywhere and I had come become to myself a vast problem Augustine here obviously in this text and I've just um, quoted from you this you know this this text he says after his friend died everything on which I set my gaze was death my eyes looked for him everywhere and I had become to myself a vast problem. The reason why I've quoted you this is because you can see here how much other people mattered to him as a factor and feature of his existence, the way that he saw the world around him. When his friend had gone, um, the world was sort of a dimmer place. Um, he was no longer able to enjoy it or see it for what it was anymore. It's a bit like a piece of the jigsaw puzzle that makes up existence had gone. And there's something that was feeding him while his friend was alive, some resource that his friend was giving him, some, something affecting his ability to see properly, to engage with the world fully. Um, that was dwindling when his friend had gone. 
So I just wanted to quote you that to sort of show that Augustine sort of the friendship that he had with others um, was sort of really um, important for influencing um, the way that he sees the world and that this is a kind of fundamental feature of this relationality that is, 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 key, um, is key in the text. Um, so just a final um, point here, um, just to make, just before we go to questions is, um, the point that all of this hinges, the, all of this discussion that Augustine has about his nature, about the nature of the other people in his life, about the fragmentary uh, quality to human life, all of this, the background of this is the doctrine of God and what it means to be God. Um, and what Augustine finds in this text and what he, he learns about in this text um, is not only that God is the creator of the world, um, but that God is the one, the source of all being, yet beyond being, the most metaphysically ultimate being, a being that cannot be grasped by human reason entirely or comprehended by reason or can't be perceived by the human senses, a, a God who is not a worldly item among other worldly items, a God that doesn't exist in the way that peop other people and, and, and human beings exist in the world, but a God who exists beyond all of thing, these things. Um, and so um, here's a final um, sort of line from the text to, to, to sort of get all of this um, home. So that whereas Augustine finds himself to be precarious, to have no access to his past or his future and to be absolutely dependent upon this God who's created him out of nothing. God as an object for Augustine's praise is entirely transcendent to that form of existence. Um, and so whereas human life is characterized by this precarity, the divine life for Augustine is characterized completely by the, by the opposite, you might say, beyond the opposite, by eternity, by self-steadfastness, by omniscience, by eternity. And it's therefore why God can be the object of, of Augustine's praise, because it's in God that the human soul can finally find its rest. So here's, here's a line from the text to deliver all of those points. He says in book one, who then are you, my God? What, I ask, but God who is Lord? For who is the Lord but the Lord? Or who is God but our God? Most high, utterly good, utterly powerful, most omnipotent, most merciful and most just, deeply hidden, yet most intimately present, perfection of both beauty and strength, stable and incomprehensible, immutable and yet changing all things, never new and never old. And you see here that by combining these opposite terms, you've got both um, deeply hidden, but most intimately present. Then you've got perfection of both beauty and strength, stable and incomprehensible, immutable and yet changing all things. In these, putting these opposites together, Augustine is showing how, us how God, you know, God completely transcends all possible human ways of knowing, all possible um, ways of, um, of understanding how, how something can be in the world, that God can be, so transcendent to be unknown to us but also so transcendent that he can get underneath our skin and that God can be more present to us than we can be to ourselves that's what makes God a mystery for Augustine um, and I think that this text is so wonderful because it wraps up in itself not just all of this um, teaching about the nature of God but Augustine in his um, story about who he is, his story about how he's repenting of all his sin, his story of how he converted to Christianity, Augustine conveys what it is to be a creature who's living within um, the context of a divine creation. Um, so that's my um, little bit on Augustine. Um, and I, um, I hope that I've done something of, of justice to the text um, there, but I think um, it'd be good if we've got a couple of minutes now for any questions that might come through. If any of you do have any questions about um, the text, then I'd be very glad to, to hear them or to read them indeed from the chat. Thanks, Ruth. It um, looks like we've got a few questions that have just uh, come through. Uh, the first one I'm seeing is somebody just asking, where can we get this book? <laughs> You can get it anywhere, honestly. This is um, my copy that I bought when I was an undergraduate. And if I just show you, um, maybe 
um, you can see that it's, it's I'm, I'm very naughty when I buy books, I write all over them. Um, but this is, an, this is a great translation by Henry Trad Chadwick, but you can get this often secondhand on the internet. There are a number of copies, you know, Penguin do a version. Um, it's, it's not in copyright anymore, so it's been translated by a number of different people. But yeah, secondhand copies online are very, very cheap. And then we've got oh, we've actually got quite a few questions now. Um, do you want me to read them out for you as we and sort of select some? Yeah, be... you if you would be happy to select them. Yeah, well. that's fine. Um, so this one here is just a, if God is meant to be all loving, then why are only some humans given grace? According to Augustine, we have a genetic propensity towards doing uh, that which is immoral and corrupt due to the actions of the fall. But why does God allow us to have this unwanted genetic propensity? That's a really good question. And this is, as you're, you're seeing there, um, this question that's come in from, yeah, from Yasmin, this is, um, this gets to right to the heart of the question, the problem of evil, doesn't it? So there's not an easy answer to that question. But what I will say is, Augustine argues that the God, the, the way that God is most perfect and most just and most loving is to create a world where humans are able to, um, to reject him. So God gives humans free will um, because he believes that to give them free will is a higher form of love than to not give them any free will. So it's within reason, Augustine says, that, you know, you could imagine a world that God created where everyone followed God's will constantly. No one sinned. But but that wouldn't be um, freedom for humans. So if God creates free will, humans are therefore able to reject God. And a result of that is sin coming into the world. Um, and uh, Augustine's doctrine of election, like you, like that question mentioned, um, states that, um, where's it gone now? Yes, we have a genetic propensity towards doing that, which is immoral. So that's original sin. So at the fall, sin comes into the world. Um, but this unwanted, this genetic, that is one way of understanding it is genetic, but nowadays you could understand original sin also in a kind of, um, in a social sense, you know, what Augustine is telling us about the, the way that we can't get over sin and we have this sort of genetic disposition to sin is that the minute that you come into a, into the world, you are influenced by other people around you. There's this kind of structural character to being immoral in the world. So even if you were trying to be as good as possible, even the language that you're using, incul, you know, is, is able to sort of uh, drag you into um, being complicit in in a world of sin um i i'll give you an example here you know the idea of um but you go into a shop and you want to buy something um ethically in order to buy something ethically you have to know where it's come from you have to know who was involved in making it you have to know about all the labor that went into that thing you're buying it would be imp genuinely impossible to go and buy a product off the shelves of a supermarket that you could guarantee did not have some layer of sin involved in its um, in its production, even if you know either it was using ingredients that meant killing a load of trees off, like palm oil, or it involved some sort of labor where people weren't getting paid enough for that labor. It is extraordinarily difficult to go and be a human being in the world without sinning. So that's sort of what Augustine's meaning by um, uh, original sin, as much as he means a genetic predisposition, I think. But the point is about um, why, you know, God being loving um, and allowing all of this to happen is the answer that Augustine gives that is that God, Augustine says God gives us the greatest gift of all, which is if you return to him, if you turn back to the loving God, um, then you don't you needn't do anything. You, you needn't do anything to secure your salvation because God gives it all to you. Um, through his grace so even if you are a sinner even if you continue to sin in life if you if you accept that God is the author of all creation and you know and you um you desire to know God again God will give you all of that and you needn't do anything for yourself so it's quite complicated this relationship in Augustine and it, it does take some work to sort of wrestle with it your him you know yourself but I, I you know I do think there are ways of reading Augustine in a way that um redeems him from this sort of um being characterized as quite a, um, a, a, a vicious sort of um, heartless character as he sometimes characterized. Um, but yeah, um, I hope that's given something of an inkling. <laughs> um, so this is, um, this is an interesting question. I don't know how much time you want to spend on um, this. It seems quite a big one. Um, 
does Augustine, sorry, how does Augustine view the relationship between time and consciousness? And also that I really like this other, the second question is that does time pass instantaneously if there are no temporal beings to perceive it? That's really interesting. So for someone like Augustine, um, God is not characterized by time and temporality. So there, you know, it's, and I think maybe this came up with your, um, maybe with Dr. Davison before. So when the world is created, there is no time before the world was created, as it were. It's not like God is subject to time so that God got up one morning and thought, oh, now I'll, <laughs> now I'll create the world. And um, so time is a facet of, um, of um, being in the world. So for that reason, human beings are innately temporal and our, our being in the world through time is, you know, the way that our consciousness is characterized too. So the way that we think is in, in innately temporal, we think in a linear way. You can't think backwards, you can't think um, um, a, I suppose, um, back to front, you can't start from the future and go towards the past. You, your consciousness will always be moving in this linear direction. Um, but time therefore, because time is a, a facet of creation, um, time wouldn't exist if there were no temporal beings, as it were, to experience it. So before the world is created, I suppose there is no time because time, God bring, brings time into creation with the world um, for Augustine. So um, time wouldn't pass if there were, when there were no things to pass with it. <laughs> you see, if I don't know if that makes any sense, but, but yeah, it's a characteristic of, 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 the, of the flow of, of human and created life. Okay, and then, okay, how about this one? Uh, how has this book affected your perception of the world, the self, and faith? Oh, wonderfully <laughs> so. Like this, I think this, um, the self in particular, this this notion that Augustine has of the self is, as I said, precarious and not transparent to itself. And what I mean by not being transparent to itself is that we cannot always see our motivations for doing things before we're doing them. You know, there are a number of factors in play and pressures upon us and temptations working within us that we're not in charge of. It's part of what I was talking before about sin is that we can be complicit in, um, in bad decisions before we've even made them and in a way that we think of ourselves as being quite innocent of them just like as I said if you go into a shop and you buy something that was made by people who weren't being paid properly for their labor um you you know you're complicit in the you know that 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 structural sin um but you're not aware of it and so there's a lot I think that he says about the human condition in the fact that we're we're not independent creatures you know our thoughts are you know, every thought we have, Augustine thinks, is in relation. So everything that we have, when everything that we think is a thought in relation to something else, whether it be an idea that we've been given by someone else, whether it be another person, we cannot create things out of nothing, which means we cannot be inspired from a, from a blank slate for Augustine. We're always building upon some existing thing when we're having a thought or is playing with existing material. Um, and I think, I think his account of his relational account of what it means to be human is, is, yeah, is deeply impressive. So yeah, it's been a massive influence on me, this book. Okay, this um, next one came in through uh, the chat from Kyle. This is asking, how does Augustine try to resolve the problem of religious language? So the premises you've described, uh, including God's transcendence, original sin, they seem to lead to the via negativa. And then they're just asking, is that correct? Absolutely. So Augustine is one of these um, thinkers who's in this long chain of um, thinkers who are influenced by the Neoplatonic tradition. So the Via Negativa that many of you may have accessed already as a, as a topic in your A-levels, this idea of apophatic theology, um, statements used of God, um, which tell us about God's nature, but only by negating certain things about God, i.e. God is not a body, God is does not have a face, God is not a gender. Um, all of these things are negated about God. You're right, so Augustine's part of this Neoplatonic tradition that embraces this mystical way of thinking about God that involves this, um, this, this negative way. And for, for Augustine, human words used about God do have 
a meaning, but they do not have that. He doesn't use language univocally. That is to say, he doesn't think when we call God good and we call a human being good, we're talking about good in exactly the same way. It's just that God has more of it. Rather, he uses language in a way that is able to sort of gesture or signify towards the absolute transcendence of God and the recognition that God is a transcendent object. But he still he still thinks that there's um, that it is important that we can say things about God, because otherwise the theological task would be really quite um, fruitless and uh, demoralizing um, if our language couldn't reach up to some extent, even if indirectly and imperfectly uh, to the being of God. So yeah, you're, that's why you're right. That's why he accesses this uh, negative tradition. And this might be a good follow-up question in this sort of context, um, but how would he respond to these to the arguments for the existence of God based on things like reason and observation? Oh, that's a difficult one. He's he's very early. So he's fourth century and it's not until you get Aquinas in the 13th century and Anselm again in the Middle Ages um, that, you know, you've got these traditional arguments for the existence of God in Aquinas and Anselm. Um, or so they've been perceived in you know, the ontological argument and the cosmological argument. Um, so he would um, he wouldn't be familiar with those um, because they came later, but what he would argue is that just like Aquinas, just like Anselm, he's got this sort of metaphysic where because God is the creator of the world and he creates the world out of nothing, we cannot look out on the world as scientific observers, let's say, and sort of find God in the world like you'd find something in a microscope. You can't, um, you can't test for the existence of God in the world in the same way that you test for an, a material cause. Um, but because the world is, is created from God out of nothing for Augustine, it is therefore possible to know God through the world as in the sense that God can be known through his effects. So it's perfectly legitimate for a religious believer who knows, knows God as the font of all being let's say that that religious believer will say something like oh um uh, uh god spoke to me through my friend or something like that even though god didn't literally speak through that friend and god cannot be again put in, in the microscope um he would be open to the idea that god can be known through creation but he um he would not um he would not want to say that you can argue to the existence of god via an idea of god um that is to say that you can kind of come up with some concept of who god is and then through reason prove that prove that concept to be true um because god is not a concept or a construct in the human mind for augustine god is the most real is the most um it's the most true the most beautiful the most real so he'd he'd be more sort of willing to sort of think through a kind of platonic um a sentence if you read if you read plato and plato's understanding of how one understands the good through reason is that reason, the hu human reason is disclosive of, of reality. And so Augustine would rather assume that your reason is the best tool you have for getting to the bottom of things in the world. And actually, if you think and reflect on the meaning of creation and you go and you, he provides an, an, an argument for the existence of God of sorts in his uh, book on the free choice of the will but there he proceeds from an observation of particulars in the world to an observation of number and of concepts that don't change and he sort of argues that there because there are things in the world that do not change and are therefore higher ontologically than our minds which are temporal and you know fall you know they 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 come into existence and they fall out of existence he says the very existence of things like number which are eternal um, signifies that there is something higher than human beings that we do not create ourselves and that we therefore must posit a first cause of of kind of, of a kind so yeah for him reason is a tool in understanding the world around us it's the best tool we have and he does have his own sort of argument for the existence of god based on sort of higher principles um so yeah he's in he's in the sort of first line but he wouldn't yeah he wouldn't have he wouldn't be acquainted with cosmological and ontological arguments because they come slightly later. And then, uh, do, are you still okay to answer a few more uh, yeah, questions? Absolutely. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just thought this this might be another one that sort of leads on from what you were saying. Um, 
So to, I, know, I know you've touched on this already, I think, but um, to what extent do you think that Augustine was influenced by Plato and Neoplatonic thinking? Completely. There's a big um, sort of discussion within secondary literature on Augustine. Um, some, I mean, it's it's completely um, undeniable that he was a Neoplatonist and that he, in this book, actually, if you wanted to go and read this book, um, he talks about the way that he reads um, the books of the Platonists. Um, and we assume these two, um, him, him to be influenced by people like Plotinus, who was a Neoplatonist. So it's undeniable that he himself, um, when he left the Manichaeans, the sect that he belonged to, um, he the, one of the ways in which he sort of started to re-narrate the world around him was via Neoplatonism. But the big discussion in the scholarship is whether it's better to say that he um, had a separate conversion to Christianity beyond Neoplatonism, or whether his Christianity was a kind of extension or thing that came together with his Neoplatonism. Um, there's a lovely phrase in the, there's uh, a book by the theologian John Rist called Ancient Thought Baptized, which is basically a play on the idea that Augustine sort of baptizes Platonic thought, um, that he takes on a number of the metaphysical presuppositions that the Platonists have, like this idea of the order of reality, the primacy of human reason, the unknowability of the one, the good, God, but that what Augustine finds in Christianity that he can't find in the Neoplatonists, which is really important to him, is Jesus Christ. And um, for Augustine, the Neoplatonists have this account of reality as you know, God as, as, as the one, the good as transcendent, and that through whom you have to sort of ascend via reason to try and reach, but you can never really reach in this life. Augustine is really sort of um, taken aback and um, is in full wonder at the idea of the incarnation because the teaching that, that, that Christians have that God is not only inaccessible and is transcendent but actually puts on human flesh and comes to meet us in the human condition that for Augustine is phenomenal um, and that's the thing that sort of is beyond Neoplatonism for him and sort of overcomes and is baptizes the Neoplatonism this idea that God is not just transcendent uh, to us but is fully imminent to us um closer to us than we are to ourselves and that this is sort of really instantiated in the incarnation where Christ kind of comes to um to save us within the human condition and that's his other answer to the problem of evil really is that um God loves us so much that he 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 suffers with us um yeah so that that that's um that's the sort of role of Neoplatonism I guess in a nutshell and then um just for anyone who wants it on uh okay yeah for, for anyone who wants to sort of look at any counter arguments to this stuff i guess you know perhaps other people knocking about in his day um with this kind of stuff who, who would you recommend um i don't yeah counter arguments i'm not sure because i mean he, he what one of the things it's worth pointing out is that he there were this is not a time where um orthodoxy as we know it now is like you know fully established you know just before Augustine you know he's late fourth century but um early fourth century you still got the doctrine of the trinity as a kind of developing doctrine the, the Greek fathers like Gregory of Nyssa Gregory Nazianzus are really working hard to try and argue that God is one and three um in a coherent fashion because these doctrines are still not uh you know it was three 325 uh, the council of Nyssa um Nicaea sorry and the council of Constantinople in in the late in in three um, later in the third century where you at uh, the fourth century where you get these doctrines sort of enshrined in a council way and you get the the council of uh, Nicaea uh, brings us the Nicene Creed that people still uh, recite in church today but Augustine's time is one of many many voices so he himself converts into and out of a number of different positions so I suppose if you wanted to really um, get to grips with what Augustine came out of, a position very opposed to his own. Um, one of these sort of sects that I mentioned, the sort of um, illegal sects at the time is Manichaeism. Go and Google Manichaeism because Augustine began his career as a Manichae and had a lot of trouble later on. You know, he became a bishop very quickly after his conversion, suspiciously quickly. And so a lot of people were still worried that he was kind of quasi Manichaean. So one of the points that um, scholars make about this text is that maybe one of the reasons he wrote this was to kind of try and prove to people that he wasn't a Manichae and that he was like a legit 
um, proper Christian priest and, and bishop because he still had a really big reputation for being quite a bad boy in being a manichae for a good portion of his life. So that was that was a big um, yeah, so in answer to that, a better, sort of better answer to that question would be that um, Manichaeism was one of the big um, threats to um, orthodoxy at that time, and that was one of Augustine's former positions. Okay. And then um, maybe just two more questions. So, so there's one here which seems quite a, sounds quite tricky, is that if free will is important, how will we retain free will in heaven as there is perfection? So that is a really good question. So in this book I've been talking about, which is on the free choice of the will, it's one of Augustine's texts where he introduces this defense, this free will defense for the problem of evil, um, which I think a number of you will have studied at school. And he also has this sort of argument for the existence of God that he introduces in that text. Um, but in that text as well, he points out that what, free, what the freedom that humans have isn't true freedom. You know, they have freedom to turn away from their maker. Um, but, you know, they have the choice to be true to God or to depart from him. And what happens in the fall, of course, is that humans choose to turn away from God. But that's not true freedom for Augustine. True freedom only belongs to God, um, which is to say that God can only do good. <laughs> God, um, God is good by nature and God will not do things that aren't good because to do what is not good i.e., to do evil things it may be a choice that we have but that's not good for us you know to do evil is just to take us away from ourselves um and this this is the underpinnings of some of you may have learned about augustine's understanding of evil as privative his account of evil as a privation as a lack of being and so what Augustine teaches about evil, um, it's a bit like it's a shadow on us. You know, if you're going to say that light is good, then evil is just the coming of, of shadow. It's non-being. It's a turning away from, from what we truly are. And so to have a choice to, to turn towards that um, is a choice to become less ourselves and not to fulfill our proper purpose um so to have to what happens in heaven augustine thinks is that we are sort of freed up from this freedom i suppose is that we're not any longer because because heaven is a re being reunited to god being aligned to our true purpose having our rest in god who is the purpose of our whole being um we are no longer blighted and and threatened and 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 made you know basically malnourished by um this desire to 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 turn away from god which is which is evil for augustine um so yeah that that sort of qualifier that he has in that text where he talks about what it is to be truly free which is to not have this temptation towards evil um which is something that um we can't hope for in this life is yeah that um, that's a really pot in key ingredient in that whole conversation, I think. And then a uh, final question. Someone wants to know, uh, are you religious? <laughs> I am, yes. Um, <laughs> although that's not relevant to that. I must point out, actually, um, you needn't be religious to do theology at Cambridge. That's really important that we have a number of students here. I, I, to be honest, I have no idea what most of my students believe about the world. I, you know, it's not a factor that comes up in our supervisions. Um, sometimes it does, but it's, you know, it's sort of by the by. I, but we have a number of students here that are from all different religious traditions or none. Um, and that's one of the beauties of studying this subject is that you're studying it, you're asked to sub study it from a kind of a position of, of disinterest often, if you're doing religious studies, if you're doing a theological paper, you're looking at how the person in question that wrote the text get these things through. I would say very challenging things about this degree is it will force you to think about the world and, and how it works and, and what your positions on these things are. But yeah, nothing is required of you as a kind of of a, as a kind of joining um, condition. Um, and yeah, um, I certainly don't wave my religion, hopefully around <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm lecturing and things like that, but yeah, I am. Thanks so much for taking um, the time to answer all those questions as well. And that was really, really useful. Um, I think we're, uh, we're basically done then, um, unless you've got any sort of like concluding remarks about uh, you know, any of this stuff. 
Um, I just want to be very enthusiastic and encouraging and um, say that if any of you have enjoyed what you've heard today, then please um, yeah, have, a, have another look at um, our website and what we offer for in divinity uh, degree wise um, and also wanted to say best of best of luck with all of your studies.